Okay, today's passage is Joshua 5, 9 through 15. So last week we covered the end of chapter 4, and our focus was choices and obedience. A lot of times we have some choices that we have to make the right decision, and how do we obey God is the main point, instead of our own logical and reasonable uh, choices. So uh, please revisit that area as well. But today, we're going through the Passover and other aspects of the passage. The focus will be the spiritual eyes, spiritual perspective. How do we look at this world as Christians? So before we get into the Passover, let's revisit circumcision, which we covered last week. If you look at Exodus chapter 12, it says to celebrate or participate in the Passover, you have to be circumcised, all the male. Then you can actually participate in the Passover. It says no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. So you cannot participate in the feast of the Passover if you're not circumcised. So if you think about that, all those things that they talked about, circumcision in front of the enemies and be sanctified or all those things are the preparation for them to participate in the Passover. And this law applies to everyone, not just the Israelites, but for the foreigners and strangers living with you, they all have to go through that to participate in the Passover. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, I just covered it, consecrate yourselves for Tomorrow, the Lord will do wonders among you. The immediate context was crossing the Jordan, the wonderful work. But consecration or sanctification, it includes the preparation of the Passover. The Passover. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month. The 14th day of the month. What month was it? If you go back to Joshua chapter 4, verse 19, the people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. So this is obviously the 14th day of the first month. Okay? In the evening on the plains of Jericho, they celebrate the Passover. If you look at Leviticus chapter 23, it says this, In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, the first month, at twilight, the evening time, is the Lord's Passover. That's the law, the Leviticus. So, without a doubt, these Israelites were following that law. Happened to be in the first month of the year. Initially, they were calling it Adib. That was the first month. So they changed it later after they came back from Babylonian exile. They start calling Nisan. Nisan is the first month. Same first month, different words. Anyhow, 14th day of the first month is Passover. The next one is this. On the 15th day of the same month, first month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you shall eat unleavened bread. So 14th day is Passover. Next day, 15th day, is unleavened bread you're supposed to eat. What happened in Joshua? The day after the Passover, they ate unleavened cake. They happened to cross the Jordan River in the first month. And somehow with God's providence, they follow every single thing they are supposed to follow. So let's look at the significance of the Passover. First instance it was recorded was in the book of Exodus. And it says this in chapter 12. Actually, it's part of the plague, the 10th one. So God says, this is going to happen to the, everyone who doesn't follow this. But you have to get the lamb and kill it and then put that blood on that doorpost. Then we're going to pass over. You're not going to be judged. That's what happened. That was the first Passover account. That was the part of the plague, but that was the beginning of wilderness. 
after the tenth plague, they were able to go to the wilderness, crossing the Red Sea and everything. The second one here in Joshua is a little bit different. They're in the promised land now. They concluded their life in the wilderness. Now, the new life began. And the way they start the new life in the promised land was by celebrating the Passover. That's what happened. Same event, two different situations. Our question to this one is this. Am I celebrating the Passover into the wilderness? Meaning, we ended up disobeying God. Or, am I celebrating the Passover in the promised land to begin my new life under God's control? We can apply that to a Sunday service. Every Sunday, are you just coming here to just listen to the Word of God and then, okay, I'm going to go on with my life from Monday uh, through Saturday? Or, you are going to be recharged, changed based on the Word of God, and then be a new person on Monday morning. If you repeat the same process over and over again, you are going to be a new person every single day. But if you don't, you are going to be the same person all the way, which is not a good thing in many cases. The manna. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. For 40 years, God has been providing manna to them. They didn't have to work. They just have to pick up those things and eat every single day. Daily bread, literally, it was provided to them. And it stopped. Does that mean God's grace and mercy in His providing hands just stop? I didn't put down on here, but if you look at John chapter 6, if you have the Bible, please go to John chapter 6. John is right after the Luke. John chapter 6, verse 47. Verse 47 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. So manna was a miracle. And the bread of life is Christ Jesus. In our lives, are you looking for some kind of miracles and God's providence in your daily lives that you face, the challenges that you face, financial issues, your health issues, your relationship issues? What did Jesus say here? Those people who ate manna in the wilderness, they all died. Our focus cannot be nearsighted. That means, oh, I want to resolve this issue. Please, Lord, give me this, give me that. That's okay, too, because we need to pray to God about those things. But if that's all you pray about, you're missing the whole point. We're not going to be here, let's say, 100 years from now. If Jesus comes back before that time, we may be lifted up. But if it doesn't, then we're not going to be here. 100 years. Then our focus and our prayer, our effort, and we're striving for something that's going to perish within that time frame. Or are you focused on the bread of life, Christ himself, the eternal life that God guaranteed us to possess if you have faith in him? So please check your eyesight. Are you looking at the manna that God provides you every day, the miracles for your daily issues and challenges? That's important. But the more important thing is the eternal, the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ himself. And even though manna has stopped, that does not mean God stopped working through us. 
just look back the past week, what happened? Actually, he just you know, walked with us every single step of the way. That's why we're here. He protected us from the harms of this world. So Christians, we have to remember this. It's from Romans chapter 8. Let's read this one together. Ready? Go. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the condemned? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So we have to remember, Passover, the most important meal for that one is the lamb. We have to kill the lamb. Because of that blood, we are going to be safe from this God's judgment. So ultimate Passover lamb is Christ Jesus himself. That's why if you look at John chapter 1, John the Baptist said this. The next day he saw John the Baptist, Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So whenever you read about the Passover in the Old Testament, whenever you read anything about the man accounts next time, always remember about Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate picture that we have to see through all these instances. Not just man, okay, that was great, miracle. All right, Christ in the Red Sea and the Passover, that was great. Yes, those are great instances. Ultimately, the culmination of all those events come down to Jesus Christ himself. That was about the Passover. And then somehow it has to shift to something else. This is uh, one of those passages that R.C. Sproul expounded on in his own sermon slash lecture, which I have to agree with him 100%. Let's take a look at this one. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? What does that mean? Are you on my side or their side? What's going to be the normal answer to that question? I'm on your side. Guess what he said? And he said, no. Excuse me? I asked you, are you on my side or their side? No. Not a good communication skill here. However, he explained down the road there. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? But let's take a look at this one. We live in this world and we have a lot of things that we have to take care of. And the way we look at it is this. Is he or she on my side? What's in it for me? It's all about us. Are you for me or against me? So if somebody is on my side or for me, that's when we love that person. Actively and very receptive about that person or group because we get benefit out of that. If the answer is no, then we don't care about who they are. Or if they're rich and successful, we become jealous about them because we don't get any of that benefit from them. Joshua, in this account, he, for a split moment, he forgot about who he was. Saying, Are you for us or for us? What kind of question was that? But that's a natural question we ask all the time. Even at home, at work, church, same thing. And that goes down to church or the Word of God as well. We come to church, when we ask this question or think about these aspects, is that what I want to hear? Something that I can agree or comforting to hear? Make sense? 
If it's yes, then we listen and be satisfied. Because all I hear is just verifying that I was right all along. Okay, he said the same thing that I was thinking. All right, great, good, good, good. But if you don't agree with that, that the answer is no, then this is the reaction. You feel uneasy. Why is he saying this? And sometimes, is he talking about me? You get angry. If you look at the New Testament, you see that kind of reaction so many times. The Pharisees were like that. They were like that when they heard Jesus' message. They're gnashing their teeth. They eventually killed Jesus because they couldn't handle that message. If you go back to John chapter 6 for the rest of the chapter, if you read the whole thing, you're going to see that they said, okay, Jesus, what you're saying doesn't make any sense. We don't like it. It's not easy. It's really hard for us. We're going to leave you. They packed up and left, except for those 12 disciples. And those people who left Jesus, they were described as many disciples. It's not just crowd, onlookers. No, they were like disciples left him. Up to that point, they seem to be the disciples of Christ. As soon as they lost their interest in what Jesus says, or he's not going to give us more food, they just left. It's all about their benefit. And that's the perspective of non-believers, non-Christians. Please don't ask yourself, is that what I want to hear when you come to church? Those are the questions that non-Christians ask. Then how about Christians? All you have to ask or think about is, is this the Word of God? He's preaching or teaching. Is it from the text? Is it from the Bible? Is he expounding on the Word of God, explaining to us? If that's the case, then you are going to listen. You'll be thankful for that message. If you truly understand what it means to be a Christian. And sometimes, it's kind of uneasy message. It applies to you, all of us. But that's when you repent and be transformed. That's how we become a Christian and being sanctified every day. So you have to ask yourself a question. I've been coming to church all my life. Am I the same person who came to church 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Nothing has changed in my life. That means you didn't really listen to the Word of God. Am I becoming more like Christ? Slowly but surely. That means you are being transformed by the Word of God. I'm going to tell you more about that in the conclusion section. The spiritual eyes, you have to have this. It says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. It's a two opposite direction. God's testimonies versus my own selfish gain. Two opposite competing concepts right there. Turn my eyes. Of course, if your heart is turned, your eye will turn too. From looking at worthless things, which is selfish gain, and give me life in your ways. We have to ask this question every single day. Whenever you face some choices to make, decisions to make, small or large, it doesn't matter. Every single time you have to do something, ask yourself this question. Am I going towards God's testimonies and His ways versus my selfish gain and worthless things? Again, that doesn't mean you have to stop enjoying everything you have in your life. That's not what I'm saying. But we have to see how our life is lined up with the Word of God. If you're always surrounded by the worldly desires and friends and habits and hobbies, and the way you spend your time is all about the worldly things, then you can never really grow spiritually. If you don't practice swimming, you cannot become a good swimmer. 
I mean, that's the law of nature. There's a Hebrew term, Mishnah. That's like a rabbi's teachings. They collected it. It's more like an oral tradition and oral laws. They put them together. And that word is literally means repetition, to repeat something. Eventually, they're using that word as to learn. If you want to learn something, if you want to be good at that, you have to repeat that over and over again. The oral law, oral tradition was like this. I'm the teacher, rabbi. I just always remember and recite what I know and give it to my students. And that person will repeat that over and over again until he masters everything, remembers everything. Then he becomes a teacher and teach other students. But somehow, later on, after several hundred years, they said, okay, it might be a better idea to put them down because I don't see any uh, diligent student who wants to repeat this one every single day. So they put him down on paper. The Word of God doesn't change. So you have to repeat yourself. Meditate on it. Pray to God. And have a fellowship with other Christians over and over again. So, let's look at the church in the first century. That's what they did. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. First thing is first, as always. Apostles' teaching is number one priority and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. First thing was, they devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. In today's term, the sermons, the preachings, Bible studies, it's all about the Word of God. Then everything followed. Everything else is very important too. Number one priority is the Word of God. And this is what happened. If you jump to verse 46 and 47, it says this. Day by day, repeating themselves, getting together again and again, attending the temple together. It's not a solo effort, right? You have to get together. And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They just got together over and over again. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. The key point is, it's not the church attendees that God increased. God increased those who were being saved. That's a true definition of evangelism. Did they send out the missionaries to different countries and different regions and then have them to evangelize that local areas? No. All they did was, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts and based on the word of God. That's all they did. And who increased the number? Who added the number? God did it. A lot of times we think we have to do something specific. All we have to do is follow the word of God and have this fellowship and this church then that's going to impact the world. It's not about the program. It's not something that you have to do something very specific all the time. Sometimes we have to. Not all the time. The focus is sticking to the Word of God, having this fellowship at church or at homes. So today's church, this is, uh, this is the way it's supposed to be. It's from Ephesians. It says, look carefully then how you walk, when the Bible says how you walk, walk in the manner, that means you have to live. How you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Who is described as unwise in the Bible? Uneducated? Poor? No. No matter how smart you are, no matter how much education you got, if you don't know who God is, you are unwise in the Bible making the best use of time, because the days are evil. He says, therefore, do not be foolish, same thing, unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. If you know the will of God, that you are considered as wise person. In the second line from Todd, it says, making the best use of the time. 
Last week, our family had a guest from Chicago. My brother's family came down here, and the people got together, a big crowd. We had some lunch, dinner, coffee all day long. We had a good time. The reason for that celebration was my mother turned 80. I cannot believe that she's already 80. I mean, she looks younger than her age, but still 80 is 80, right? When I was in Korea, uh, I used to help my, my mother a lot, going to the marketplace and different things. And uh, when I was in high school, when I just walked down the street with my mother and waiting for the bus to come, because back then we were all using public transportation. It's a normal thing um, in Korea. And a lot of people referred her as my sister. And your sister, she's my mother. So I know I look older than my age, and my mother looks younger, but still. That lady, my mother, right? She's just turned 80. All those time passed by just like this. Making the best use of the time. That's very important, guys. When you spend time with your family members, enjoy that as much as you can. It's such a precious time. Husband and wife, sisters, brothers, relatives, the community of faith, church members, enjoy each other. The time will not wait for you. And because my mother is 80, I'm 56. My brother from Chicago is like, oh, what happened to your hair? Uh, don't, let's not talk about my hair. Yeah, so, and it says this, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Getting drunk with wine and be filled with the Holy Spirit, similar knowledge there. If you get drunk, what happens? You lose yourself. It's not you anymore. That alcohol took over you. It's going to drive you. If you drive when you're drunk, not a good idea. Don't. But that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. Same thing. If you're filled with the Spirit, you are going to be different than who you are. The way you make decisions, the way you talk to other people, the way you handle other people will be different. And then people will say in this world, that's not really a reasonable thing to do. There's no benefit of doing that. You're going to lose that little gain that you could get if you make a decision like us. Similar analogy. When I use this verse or refer to this verse about do not get drunk, there's always a person asking this question. Okay, the Bible says do not get drunk. It doesn't say, do not drink. It's a side note. Just so you know, it doesn't say, do not drink. But please revisit this verse again, because I'm going to cover a little bit. Unwise is not a good thing. Do not be foolish, because it's not a good thing. But be wise and understand what the will of the Lord is, meaning... If you know who God is, you will be wise, considered wise in the Bible. If you don't know who God is, you will be considered foolish or unwise in the Bible. And it says, do not get drunk. The same passage right there. And be filled with the Spirit. And the question is, the Bible says, do not get drunk. It doesn't say, do not drink. You know, it's not my call. I don't drink. Some people drink. I know some pastors drink for their own health. Wine's good for them. That's fine. It's their choice. All I'm saying is the Bible says differently. Proverbs chapter 20. Let's read this one together. Ready? Go. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. That's all I'm saying. The Bible says if you're kind of into this wine and strong drink, even if you don't get drunk, 
It's not a wise thing to do. So if you want to apply this to your life, that'll be good. If you say, just like people that I showed you, all right, that's not what I want to hear, then it's your choice. We have to be wise in God's eyes, not in my own eyes. Our questions should be like this. Don't wonder about why you didn't change up to this point. Some of you may be wondering about it. Did you ever give up anything that you enjoy, that you like, you cherish, which is a worldly thing, for the sake of glory of God in your life? If you have not gave up on anything that you enjoy in this world and wonder, what happened to my spiritual growth? It never happened. Stop wondering, because if you never gave up anything for God, nothing will happen. If you go back to Romans chapter 8 that I just, we just read together, God gave his son for us. Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. For who? For the sinners. We never deserve that grace and mercy of God. But he died to save us. He gave up everything he had. And we cannot even give up my hobby, my wine or strong drink or smoking habit, whatever it is, and wondering why I'm not growing spiritually. My prayer for you is if you give up one thing, that it was never possible for you to give up, that's going to be a starting point of your transformation. If you give up one thing that you really don't want to give up, other things will follow. Always the beginning is the toughest thing. Then that giving up effort will be replaced by being filled by the Holy Spirit then you are going to be a different person before you know it. It takes time. Now please, this week, pray about it. You don't have to quit everything you enjoy. Again, again and again, that's not what I'm saying. Um, but the things that kind of eat up, take up your time so much, it doesn't help you to think properly. Please start from small things and see what happens, prayerfully.